3 p.m. live from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, that's Josh Lipton, this is Yahoo Finance Live, and here's what we're watching this afternoon. AI optimism, driving the gains on Wall Street. The big winners in today's session are Google and AMD. That's after key AI announcements this week. The Nasdaq outperforming the Dow and the S&P 500, but investors are waiting on the November jobs report. That's out ahead of the open tomorrow. And we're following the trending tickers you should be watching. That includes JetBlue and PayPal. The airline soaring on earnings as the company sees strong demand for travel. But PayPal, that's sliding after Amazon says it will no longer accept Venmo for payments. The fallout later in the program. Plus, mortgage rates extending their decline, falling to a four-month low last week. The 30-year fixed rate now at 7.03%. That's according to Freddie Mac. And with Treasury yields sliding, we could see mortgage rates break below 7%, well, sometime soon. Let's get you up to speed on the market action here. When it comes to equities, we are seeing a resumption of the rally, it looks like here today. After a couple of days of not as much action, we are seeing more, some, more so here today, particularly when it comes to large cap tech, which is coming roaring back, once again seeing a big divergence between the NASDAQ and the Dow. The NASDAQ up about 1.2% today, whereas the Dow's only up not even two tenths of a percent. That's about 67 and a half points. The S&P 500 uh, hovering there in the middle up three quarters of 1%, and it all has to do with large cap tech. Indeed, the two best performing groups here, communication services, as well as information technology, uh, then bringing up the caboose, as our friend Brad Smith likes to say, is the energy index and utilities once again, just as they have been all year. We're going to dig into some of these individual movers like AMD, like Alphabet, uh, in just a few minutes. But first, we got to talk about what's going on in the broader market as well. Stocks are indeed trending higher today. The S&P 500 looking to snap a three-day losing streak. Bonds moving in the opposite direction. The five-year showing the biggest drop going into the close. And joining us now, Riverfront Global Fixed Income CIO, Kevin Nicholson. Kevin, it's good to see you. We've had some volatility in the bond market today, driven in part by some commentary from the Bank of Japan. But of course, in general, recently, the trajectory has been yields lower, prices higher. What are we looking like uh, into the Fed meeting next week? Well, I think that the bond market has overreacted. I expected yields to come down as the economic data had slowed. Um, But what what we've seen is that we've seen roughly 85 basis points uh, uh, of yield come out of the bond market. And one of the things that the Fed had focused on was saying that financial conditions were sufficiently tight because of the rise that we had seen at the long end of the curve. But effectively, we've undone those rate hikes um, that the Fed was um, speaking of with this big move that we've had in uh, the yield curve. So, um, you know, right now, what the um, Fed funds futures are indicating is that they're for two hikes, uh, excuse me, two cuts uh, next year. And right now we are are not in agreement with that. We're thinking that rates are going to uh, just be held steady. And Kevin, can I just ask you when you when you think about what's driving this big rally uh, in, in bonds? I mean, look at the yield on ten year four one three here. If you were to you know listen, you could talk about cooling inflation and and as you were mentioning the market's expectations for the Fed. I'm just wondering, Kevin, do you think this is in part also just is this investors covering shorts as well? I mean, when you see a rally like this, it certainly comes to mind. Yes, I think that at this point there is some FOMO going on, uh, especially going into the end of the year. Uh, our investment thesis is that we're going to possibly you know, continue this rally through the end of the year, but we're going to see this flip at the beginning of next year um, as you know, calmer heads uh, uh prevail um, be just because when you look at the data, um, we're not slowing to the pace of a recessionary pace. And that is basically what the bond market is pricing in is recession, um, given the fact that uh, yields have moved so fast uh, and come down so quickly. You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm looking at your forecast for next year. You're looking at a 2024 10 year of 475 percent, obviously well above where we are right now. Um, but uh, 2024 is a long period of time. Like, what are you seeing that as the average for the year? Are you seeing that as year end? And what's going to drive those yields back up uh, to that level? 
I think it's it's more of the average uh, for the year. Um, as I think yields will get pushed back up to that level um, if we do not see the rate cuts. Um, and right now, you know, like I said, the market is forecasting two rate cuts in the first half of the year. If we don't see that happen, then you're going to all of a sudden uh, see a lot of the momentum that has been in this market actually pushed out. Um, and one of the things that I look at is where, where are we on um, you know inflation, specifically um, sticky uh, inflation, so CPI. And sticky CPI is still at 4.95%. That's well above the 2% um, range that the, the Fed uh, is looking at and or the target that they are looking at. And more importantly, those are sticky CPI encompasses the big expenditures such as shelter, and medical expenses and education expenses. And you know, and that's where people are gonna spend the bulk of, of their money. So I think that um, the market has just gotten ahead of itself. Um, and also the market is also depending on um, spending to slow down. But when you look at uh, you know, ADP's report yesterday and you look at where the wage uh, wages are for the um, folks that are, you know, um, job changers, they're still getting pay increases of 8.3%. Those job stayers are getting uh, wage increases of 5.6%. And you have headline CPI sitting at 3.2%. And even in the non-financial companies, they're getting wage increases of 4.5%. So the wage increases are still higher than inflation. So that's going to lead to more spending. And I think that that's going to cause the Fed to be um, higher for longer than um, the markets are anticipating right now. And so, Kevin, kind of, you know, let, let's just keep on that argument right there in terms of wages. I'm just interested tomorrow, another big data point, that big, that big jobs number, Kevin. Let's say that comes in, you know, hotter than expected, stronger than expected. What would you expect to see in response in the bond market? Uh, if it comes in hotter than expected, I think that you're going to probably see the bond market go up by 10 to 15 basis points. I think that you're going to really see a sell off uh, abruptly, kind of and not to the same degree as that uh, the momentum that we got to the downside. But I think that you're going to cause a lot of investors to rethink uh, their investment thesis that the Fed is actually going to uh, cut rates instead of just leaving them um, higher for longer. Because right now, uh, the market is fighting the Fed. And, you know, that is our golden rule is not to fight the Fed. And, um, you know, all year long, the market has been fighting the Fed. And all year long, uh, they have been incorrect. And so we'll uh, we'll see whether or not the Fed uh, remains, uh, uh, continues to have the advantage or if the market has the advantage. Um, and Kevin, finally, I want to ask you also about a little bit of a, I guess, a technical um, support for treasuries that we've seen to some extent for years, and that's foreign demand for treasuries. Some of the more recent auctions, not just for foreign demand, but domestic demand as well, has been choppier. How are you seeing that factor going into 2024 as well uh, at play in the treasury market? Well, Julia, it's funny that you mentioned the auctions because we have a three-year auction and a 10-year auction next week and 30-year. And it's going to be important to look at those uh, auction results next week to, to kind of give us some insight of how it will uh how yields will react going forward because now that we're down nearing four uh, percent on the 10-year it's going to be a very different uh, atmosphere as it pertains to the number of buyers that comes in additionally when you think about uh, the fixed income markets you think about japan japan is the largest holder outside of the u.s of you know of our treasuries and uh, if the BOJ actually um, decides to finally get rid of yield curve control, uh, their yields are going to go up, and that's going to uh, entice more of uh, you know Japanese buyers to actually stay at home and not buy, participate in our treasury market. So then that's going to take some demand out of the treasury market as well. So that's part of the reason why I have yields, uh, expecting yields to be a little higher uh, in um, 2024, but I don't think that we're going to you know, reach the highs that uh, we had, uh, you know, we saw this year. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Josh.
And now to our trending tickers, AMD among the winners on Wall Street today, the chip giant unveiling a new AI chip yesterday as it looks to challenge NVIDIA. Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi sitting down with AMD CEO Lisa Su about the announcement last night. Take a listen. I think the most important thing is look at the potential, look at the size of this market. I mean, there are going to be multiple winners in this market. Um, I think there are very few companies who can bring this kind of technology to the market. Um, I'm, you know, super honored and super proud of, you know, our team and our partners that we can come together and put all this tech out there. Absolutely. I think there's a great growth opportunity for us. And uh, yeah, we expect to gain market share. Yeah, and one number here, Julie, that really um, caught people's attention was really when Lisa Su talked about her estimates for kind of just the size of the AI chip industry, now saying she thinks it could hit $400 billion in the next four years, importantly, because that is up from the $150 billion outlook offered a year ago. So you can just kind of see the confidence she has in this opportunity. Now, now how really you know big and sustainable that ultimately proves to be, we'll see, but certainly very optimistic from Dr. Su. Well, and it's interesting to hear we're talking about gaining market share. I mean, they're coming from nowhere, I think, if we're talking about the direct head-to-head -head AI chips that NVIDIA has already been ahead on. So, of course, they're going to gain some market share. But also, if the market is $400 billion for this, even though it is going to be very competitive with these two, advanced micro devices and NVIDIA, and also with Intel and also with all of the other chip makers out there, that implies that it's a big market, and even if you're fighting for that market share, it's still going to be substantial in terms of growth. So that's another one of my takeaways, and it should be really interesting the next yep. year to see as we get this sort of arms race between these AI chip providers. And, and what a year for Lisa Sue's company, too. I mean, AMD, yeah. I mean, up to date, now up nearly 100% in 2020. Yeah, well, there's just yeah. been this anticipation that AMD yep. was really going to come out with a vengeance, and it seems like that's what they're doing. Uh, let's also talk about Alphabet, the tech giant soaring after launching its AI model, Gemini, which it calls its most powerful tool yet. Now, what's interesting about this is this was announced yesterday uh -huh. during this regular session, and the stock didn't do much of anything. But today, we are indeed seeing it move higher. So it's interesting. Um, J.P. Morgan analyst Doug Anmuth kind of alluding to that. He said, Wall Street mostly yawned at the release on Wednesday, perhaps viewing the product as not quite complete and the timing both pressured and opportunistic. So I don't know what changed between yesterday and today. Maybe it's what was happening with bonds yields. Although I, I, I don't have a good you know, explanation we talked, for it that. Was like, Maybe the focus more on AI today. It was I like when we talked about the financial analyst grabbing dinner with Robin Hood then thinking it over after the meal. Maybe so, some maybe so. I, I will say, to your point, I mean, it was I saw, it was a lot of positivity on the street. Mm -hmm. you know, Roth, MKM also chime in saying they expect negative AI sentiment toward Google to fade quickly, leading to an uptick in its valuation multiple. So they like what they heard too. They actually raised their price target to 166 on the name. You know, there was this perception, Julie, you remember that Google was kind of falling behind mm -hmm, here, mm -hmm. despite all the time and effort and money it put into this tech. So maybe that's part of what you're seeing here is too, some easing of those concerns. Yeah, could be, but yeah. this is another one that's been a monster year to date. It has not really slowed down the price appreciation yep. to a big degree. All right, and finally, let's just got PayPal. Under pressure, Amazon sending a letter to its users that they will no longer be able to use Venmo to make payments starting early next year. So this one, the headline here seems to be, okay, you know, PayPal, the news is Amazon's telling their Prime users, it sounds like, Julie, pay with Venmo will no longer be available for checkout on their website. Goes into effect, it sounds like, January 10th. Users will still, it sounds like, also, they can still use Venmo debit and credit cards, mm. but you know, this was, they, remember they initially rolled this partnership last year, actually around this time, October of last year, um, Evercore saying uh, PayPal was hoping to monetize Venmo more effectively. Amazon was clearly looking to get kind of exposure to the newer, younger customers. Bare bottom line is they, we expect this news is simply the result of a lack of traction as consumers just fail to adopt using well, pay with Venmo as their preferred checkout. I mean, it's sort of just another thing when it comes to PayPal. In sharp contrast with the two tech giants we were just talking about, this stock is down year to date by more than 20% yep. and is undergoing this big transition from longtime CEO Dan Schulman to Alex Chris, who's going to be the new CEO. They've talked about reorganizing some new business units to sort of sharpen the focus of the company. And so it, it, this feels sort of incremental yeah. given that backdrop. Um, as we talked about, we're going to get a bigger sort of payments landscape outlook tomorrow with an analyst. But it, um, it's an interesting time for PayPal in particular in that universe.
Yeah, this Evercore note, actually, I thought a really interesting point they made was PayPal has kind of discussed, they said, a certain number of Venmo partnerships, right? They've discussed, you know, Uber and Grubhub. Their point, their clients was this news sort of creates concern, in their opinion, around kind of just PayPal's ability to monetize mm -hmm. on those platforms. So to your point, not news that you needed. No. Definitely not. All right, we're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, a new installment of our new series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll bring you investment recommendations for your portfolio. Plus, earnings after the bell. We'll break results from Lululemon and Broadcom and provide in-depth analysis. And also a new episode of our series, Lead This Way, where we talk to industry leaders who are shaping the companies of today and tomorrow. We'll speak to Campbell Soup CEO Mark Klaus when Yahoo Finance returns. Today we have the latest installment of Yahoo Finance's Lead This Way series, where we talk with top execs across different industries on their biggest challenges and how they're leading through them. Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi met up with Campbell Soup Company CEO Mark Klaus on his journey in leading the 150-year-old food company. Hi, Saz. Hi. All right. In our sit-down conversation, I had the chance to peel back the layers of Mark Klaus's mindset as a leader at Campbell Soup after taking the helm in 2019. With more than two decades of experience in the food industry, here's how he approaches leadership. Leadership is a muscle. And in my experience, honestly, it is the great differentiator. Two decades before Mark Klaus earned the top spot at Campbell's, he was rising the ranks in the Army. The leadership skills Mark learned in the service allowed him to steady Campbell's after taking over, guide the company through COVID, balance the need of investors and customers in the current economic climate, and prepare this historic brand for success into the future. I'm at Campbell's headquarters in Camden, New Jersey to get a basic training on how he became such an inspirational leader and went from captain to CEO. One of the greatest gifts in my life after being a parent and a husband was getting the opportunity to lead men and women in the military. I got to do that at a very early age in my life. I'm not here today. Honestly, if I don't have that foundational experience, just so lucky uh, to have had that opportunity and privilege. Talk to us about your leadership pillars, and does that ultimately reflect a lot of lessons that you learned in the military? The day that I stop learning about leadership is probably the day I should stop leading people. My philosophy on leadership is shaped very heavily by that time in the military. A task number one, 
is set a clear direction, one that's simple enough that everybody in your organization, top to bottom, can understand. Two, assemble the right people that, that you know, be self-aware enough to know who will compliment you. You don't want to surround yourself by people that agree. And then third, it's about inspiring and motivating. Mark, it's not easy to inspire a large workforce that you have here at a company like Campbell's. How do you inspire people? What are some of your examples of pulling this off successfully? It's not a simple question, right? Because I think it depends a little bit on the day and the circumstances. There tends to be leaders um, that approach leadership in one of two ways. There's either pushers or there's lifters. You can be a pusher, that shoulder down, just shoving people forward. The problem is when you run into real obstacles as a pusher, that's when organizations come grinding to a halt. You can also be a lifter, and that's really what I've tried to do, right? Instead of just being that constant force of execution and deliver, how do you create this, this feeling of empowerment so that when they run into those barriers, they have the opportunity to overcome them? Just before you took over, this was a very different company. You know, there was pressure to do this, to improve returns. Those first 30 days really set the tone for what you've been doing since. What was your playbook in those yeah, early days? Sure. What did you tell your team? Yeah. Is there a no, moment it's, that's it's a great, It's a great question. And I think there were some real foundational learnings around leadership um, that have followed me throughout my career. And one of the things that I think uh, leaders can make the mistake of is, well, look, I'm gonna sit down, I wanna let it, I wanna absorb for 30 days or 90 days, and then I'll organize, or maybe I'll bring in a consultant and we'll- Still time for that. Right? Yeah, no, like set a direction. Be clear about a path forward. Even if you're 80-20 on that, set the path and get the organization mobilized. And the simpler you can make it, the better. So for me, in those first 30 days, it was really about setting clarity and simplicity around direction. You start to get the structure right, you're improving the culture, you're getting the operations where they need to be, and then boom, COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. When that started, how, what was your leadership playbook? Because we couldn't get products on the shelves. It was a tragic moment in, in our history. I think for us though, one of the things that was quite powerful was this concept that your friends, family, and neighbors are gonna depend on us, right? I don't wanna to sound too uh, much of a cliche, but in, in the world we were in, um, our ability to keep food moving through the system meant that people uh, going to the grocery store would find you know, chicken noodle soup or find that, that bag of goldfish. I think the company was able to take a terrible situation like COVID and, and really turn it into a cultural catalyst for the company that solidified a lot of what we had been trying to do even before. And I think this leads up to one of your next chapters. And I would say it's responsibility to keep what you make affordable. Right. Because at the end of the day, a can of soup could feed a family of four. Right. Does that weigh on you? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's one of those um, balancing acts, I think, is the way I would describe it, where you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, how do we protect uh, the financial integrity of these businesses while we ensure um, that we're keeping accessibility there on products that we know are incredibly important in moments where uh, consumers are struggling. The, the benefit of a portfolio is it does give you some of the flexibility to make those choices. I can't believe you're buying a pasta sauce company because to make full disclosure, shocked the hell out of me. I'm like, I think Mark's gonna get something in snacks and then boom, boom. Rayo, Rayos. <laughs> the day before that deal, what were you thinking? We, I think we were collectively excited about it. Um, and you know, I was, uh, you know, intrigued to see if, if the strategic merits of this would, would resonate with investors. To be able to add that, absolutely 100% offensive play aligned with our strategy, and I think really positions us for the future. You're the 14th CEO at this company. When your time is done, what do you think your leadership legacy will be in yeah. an iconic American company Well, you know, like I, this? I think about legacy in the sense of, we, we, we actually talk about this. And to me, the definition of legacy is something that happens that otherwise would not have happened had we not been there. I hope it is looked at as the moment where we were able to prove to the world, to everyone, 
that these brands that are 150 years old can be every bit as relevant today as they were back then while adding these incredibly differentiated brands that just reach a whole nother level of contemporary relevance and that, that we can demonstrate that that can be done together in a portfolio that can be successful and best in class in the food industry. Sazi, great job as always, my friend. Appreciate it. After talking to Mark Klaus, let me ask you this. What were some of your big takeaways? You know, you listen to him where he wants to lead the company. Where do you think, after listening to him, where do you think Campbell's Soup is heading? Well, I, I put up a checklist here of things I think investors need to know. But above all of that, I, I think if you're watching this and you're an investor uh, looking for new investments or maybe own shares of Campbell's Soup, you're probably wondering or thinking, okay, great. I just learned how to lead from a Mark Klaus. That's all fine and good. But what does it actually mean to me as an investor? Well, guys... This is the person leading this iconic food company. It's his ideas, it's his leadership style that has fundamentally restructured Campbell's Soup. It's his ideas that are filtering through his executive leadership team and throughout the company. He has fundamentally turned Campbell's Soup around because before he started, he was under, Campbell's Soup was under activist pressure. They made a series of uh, just acquisitions that didn't work out too well. He has improved profit margins. He has taken uh, and improved the company's culture. He has driven a lot more innovation. I look at some of the new products now starting to hit from Goldfish recently. Uh, Goldfish crisps uh, starting to hit shelves. That is innovation in the snack food category. They have now expanded uh, their Snyder's Lance business as well. Uh, so by and large, he has fundamentally changed this company because of how he operates as a leader, which in large part reflects his time in the military. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting stuff. I'm also curious always when we talk to these leaders, like what it's like to work at the company, you know, if more people stick around longer under his leadership and that's Julie, it's a, it's a big job. I've taped a series of these and, and they'll start hitting in the, in the weeks uh, ahead. But what I've learned, these are pressure cooker gigs. Uh, they are full-time gigs, they are around the clock. And I know a lot of executives get hammered for how much they make in, in a year and things there and their travel and the, and the perks they get. But these people are working their asses off. Uh, every single person that I talk to for this job, whether it's, I look at Steve Ballmer coming up next week, former long time Microsoft CEO, now leading the LA Clippers. He is working his butt off to improve the LA Clippers. In the case of Mark, he's thinking, all right, well, what does the next few years of Campbell's Soup look like? How do I close this Rayo's deal? How do I improve profits? And then how do I do good for workers? It's not, it shouldn't all be adversarial stuff here. I mean, this guy is trying to do good. We have to hold him to account, of course, but by and large, the results have been good, and he deserves to be on this program. Sauce, thank you so much. Appreciate Looking it. forward to uh, some of those other ones. On site. Happy to be here. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sauce. Coming up, our new series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to bring you investment recommendations for your portfolio, one stock to buy, one stock you might want to avoid. That's after the break.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye, brought to you by E-Trade from Morgan Stanley. Our goal, to help cut through that noise, to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. And the noise has been incredibly loud this year around one term, artificial intelligence. Of course, NVIDIA has long dominated the conversation, but now other AI-related investing ideas are starting to pop up, and some companies already seem to be falling behind the curve. What's the best way to play it right now? I'm here with Nancy Tengler, CEO and CIO of Laffer Tengler Investments. Thank you, first of all, so much for being here. Really appreciate it. So let's get right to it. When we're talking about this theme, your buy is Broadcom. Um, and we'll get to AI sort of lastly here, but I do want to dig through the various reasons, Nancy, for your um, buy on this, goodbye on this. First of all, the company getting a debt rating upgrade, and it's sort of unusual that it's getting it at this time. Talk yeah. us through that. Well, of course, they just completed the VMware uh, acquisition, and doing so uh, doubled up the debt. Uh, but the company has done a really good job with free cash flow and returning um, sh uh, cash back to shareholders as well. And so I, I thought it was um, timely, and we'll probably see another one in the future. Interesting, another yeah, one. and unusual, definitely, yeah. if they're increasing their debt to that extent. Um, you alluded to this, the strong capital return turn here. So do you expect that to continue and even grow as we go into the next year? Yeah, Hawktown has done a great job of returning cash to shareholders mm -hmm. through share buybacks and through dividend increases. And the, the historical dividend increase on this stock is like 25% over the last five years. Now, that's probably going to slow uh, after the, they report after the bell today. Yes, they do. So, <laughs> uh, fingers crossed. But even even if, it, if the stock goes down, it's a great opportunity to jump in. But the dividend growth will probably slow uh, on the heels of the VMware acquisition. Position. Right, that would make sense. And then finally, let's get to the AI exposure, right? This is something following in the heels of NVIDIA and some of the huge numbers that it's been putting up this year. I think a lot of investors have asked, okay, where next? Where are we seeing it next? We got a little hint of it from AMD, for example. What do you expect from Broadcom? Yeah, so in our firm, we call Broad, uh, Broadcom the poor man's NVIDIA. <laughs> uh, it's get, getting about 25% of revenues, that's their expectation, from uh, super enterprise cloud computing chip sales. Um, but now they're also sort of diversifying that with 50% of total revenues coming from software. So we like the diversification you get here. They are a leader in AI. Uh, they expect to grow about 50% quarter over quarter, 200% year over year. So in just that portion of the business. So I think this is a place where you can hide out for a very long period of time. The stock has been a, a supercharged performer for the last five years. I bought it when the computer Associates uh, acquisition was made mm. and everybody hated it. I think that was about $180 a share. It's trading close to a thousand. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the potential risk here, though. What could go wrong for your thesis on Broadcom? Yeah, well, so I mean, they do have uh, customer concentration risk. And so Apple's one of their, their biggest customers. We know Apple is getting into the chip business, so um, that's something to watch. But I think this management team is pretty savvy. Uh, and that's why this pivot into generative AI uh, enterprise computing is really important for them because they, they're ahead of the game. I mean, they're behind NVIDIA, but they're ahead of everyone else. So I, I think they're going to be just fine, but that, of course, is a risk. Okay, and you do hold Broadcom, we should mention as yeah, well. Yeah, it's one of our largest holdings across okay. all of our that strategies. Makes sense. You're very enthusiastic yes. about it. Okay, now let's talk about one that you are not so enthusiastic about. This one, not as much directly in the chip or the AI industry, but there is a connection here. And it's Interpublic Group, which yes. is the big advertising company, IPG as it's known. So let's talk about your more bearish thesis when it comes to IPG. And first of all, here they have a, a different stance on AI than some of their competitors within digital advertising. So what are, what are they saying about it? Well, they're not saying anything, and that's part of the problem. And we sat on the conference call. We owned the stock. We're now out of the stock. Mm. Our investing theme is old economy companies that are embracing the digital revolution, generative AI, cloud computing, and the suppliers of those products. So Broadcom would be a supplier. Um, we want to own old economy companies that are, are really engaged, and their competitors all have joint ventures uh, with other, with gender. One has, uh, I think it's Omicom that has it with Google and uh, um, Meta. I, I don't know, I can't remember. It's in WPP maybe Thank with you. Meta, yes. 
Yeah, so the other ones are doing it and IPG isn't doing it. And they're it. very very defensive about it. They're huh. saying, well, we're using digital advertising, but they're not embracing this. And I think uh, generative AI for advertising is, is crucial. Interesting. Okay, so you also are looking at weakening growth here mm -hmm. from the company. What, what's fueling that? Is it the general macro environment or is it something more specific to IPG? I think it's more specific to IPG. Mm -hmm. This is a company that, that should be growing in line with the rest of the peer group and they're lagging way behind. Next year, if you're in it, you may get a chance to, to sell it on a bounce because next year we're gonna get all the political advertising. It's already starting. Um, that usually is a benefit for these companies, but you really need to have for the long-term holding of the stock, you need for management to catch up on the whole AI, generative AI issue. Okay, and then finally, uh, organic revenue growth might not be as resilient. So there is some stuff that's specific to IBG, but there's also some stuff going on in the broader universe. Yeah. But here's, uh, here's a look at IPG, which is the top line here, versus its peers. Mm -hmm. And you can see, you know, the numbers on the top line here are smaller than most of the others. Yeah, and generally speaking, I mean, even though those look like small differences, it, it, the, the um, impact on margins is super powerful. And so if you've got Omnicom that's got three and a half to 5%, while IPG is growing one to two, that's a material difference. And so we're, we are, um, we, we are out of the stock. We're, we're get probably likely to stay out of the stock. Mm. Uh, but if you own it, I still think you might get a shot at, at selling it at a little higher levels. All right, and then finally, just like we asked about the risk um, for Broadcom, we ought to have to ask about the upside risk for this one. What could go right? Could, I guess, a pivot all of a sudden if they're changing yes. what they're gonna do That's with it, regard Julie. to AI? Yeah, it's a, and, and this management team has not shown a willingness to even admit they're behind. But if they do pivot, then I think it's a really interesting opportunity to step in and buy a B beaten down name that's trading at a pretty decent valuation um, because a pivot will improve their revenue growth, clearly. All right, and as you mentioned a couple times, you exited the stock at yes. the end of September. You like Broadcom. Let's just recap the goodbye and the goodbye of <laughs> Nancy telling investors, buy Broadcom. The stock got that S&P debt upgrade with a positive outlook. There's strong capital return and increasing AI exposure. On the other side, you're saying avoid IPG management, justifying that limited AI exposure approach. Revenue and operating margin growth expected to be weak in 2024. And similarly, organic revenue growth might not be as resilient as initially anticipated. Nancy Tengler, Thank you so much for doing this. Julie, Good to see you in you. person. This is such a nice excuse to get people here in the studio to see us in person as well. Thanks so much for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll be bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Tune in tomorrow. We will tell you which stock in the Magnificent Seven is a buy and which to avoid. We'll be right back.
Shares of Alphabet getting a boost following Google's announcement of its latest artificial intelligence model called Gemini. Here with the very latest details is Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley. Dan. That's right, Josh. This is a new kind of uh, platform that Alphabet Google is launching. This is the basic uh, foundation of what they're going to be putting into their products moving forward. So Gemini is going to be available in three different versions. One is a nano version, one is kind of a base version, and one is a full-on uh, data center version. This is going to be powering everything from uh, eventually search to uh, the experience on smartphones to YouTube, you name it, this is going to be where Google is going to be powering a, a lot of its platforms. And it's a very big deal because this is something that the company has been working on for some time. They had discussed it previously uh, at its Google I.O. conference. There were reports that it wasn't going to be able to roll out Gemini until next year, but clearly that's not the case. Uh, and there's been some interesting demonstrations that they've shown. For instance, uh, they fed the AI uh, video of a uh, demonstrator drawing a picture of a duck and the AI was able to view the duck and recognize that it was actually a duck. And then the pre uh, presenter colored it in blue. Uh, the AI recognized that it was colored blue and said, most ducks aren't blue. Uh, and then he pulled out a uh, rubber duck and the AI recognized that that was a rubber duck that was blue and said some Ducks can be blue, I guess, and it kind of went on from there. It's also able to do things like, uh, uh, for instance, with parents, if there are, uh, they're working on the uh, homework with their students, uh, it was able to look at the homework answers, handwritten answers, uh, recognize which ones were right and which ones were wrong, and then explain where the ones that were wrong went wrong. So, so it's really powerful. This is what's called natively multimodal, meaning it, uh, rather than stitching together a, a type of the model for text or audio or video or photos, it's built for those modes from the ground up. And so Google says that this is going to make it much more powerful than a stitched together version. So basically they're, they're kind of using this uh, as a means of showing, look, we came up with the transformer technology. We're, we're the ones who helped develop it. Uh, we're not going to be left behind. This is the, the state of the state of the art, uh, and, and we're going to put this into our products full steam ahead. And so Dan, as you mentioned, listen, big moment here um, for Google. Let's also pull back the lens though, and just talk about you know, what this means for the kind of the greater AI arms race we're seeing here. You know, how does this product, Dan, in your opinion, how does it stack up to Microsoft, to OpenAI? Yeah, I mean, this is a direct competitor to OpenAI's uh, GPT-4. Uh, that's their, their you know, high-end uh, uh, model that they have right now. And Microsoft uses GPT-4 in some of its uh, own offerings. So really, this is a strike at both OpenAI and Microsoft. Uh, I mean, any strike at OpenAI is going to directly impact Microsoft as well. So you know, it's kind of six to one half dozen the other, which one they say they want to target. But uh, I digress. I think this is mostly uh, a ability for Google to, to like I said, say, we're, we're not going to be left behind. Uh, OpenAI may be huge. They may be getting all of the play still because, I mean, look, ChatGPT blew all of this up. Um, and so they're seen as the, the kind of first movers here as far as commercializing this at least. Uh, but Google doesn't want to be uh, kind of sidelined. So, you know, right now, uh, this new Gemini product is going to be available uh, in some of Google's smartphones, the, the Pixel 8 Pro, uh, as well as the version of a version of its Bard chatbot. Eventually, it's going to be in its search generative experience, which is basically a version of Google search with generative AI built in. Uh, standard Google search uh, is likely to come later. Uh, but you know, Microsoft already has its standard search as uh, offering generative AI. So Google's still not necessarily there yet. They, they are clearly taking it uh, a little bit slower because search is the most important part of its business. So they don't want to mess it up at all by adding something that might not be ready for prime time. All right, a big fun fight to watch, an important one for investors. Dan Halley, thanks so much. Well, Rent the Runway recently reporting earnings for the third quarter and coming in below estimates. But the company is optimistic about an upward trajectory, citing a shift in quality over quantity in its inventory and return to work policies, bringing people back to the office. And they 
want to look nice. Joining me now, Rent the Runway CEO, Jennifer Hyman. Full disclosure, longtime Rent the Runway customer. I got to Rent the Runway dress on right now. Um, so well, we Je appreciate you, Julie. <laughs> Thank <Thanks>. you. <laughs> Jen, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, as part of that earnings report, you also did a debt restructuring to kind yes. of buy you some breathing room, right? Where you're not going to have those debt servicing costs over the next few years. And on your uh, conference call, you referred to the elephant in the room that you know you were carrying this debt, that your stock has really come down quite a bit, to say the least. Do you think you convinced the street? I mean, the stock has still been going down. What do you think you need to do to convince investors? Yeah, I mean, we are in a world of investor kind of purgatory in that there's zero belief in the business from an investor standpoint. Now, why is that? And there's really two elephants in the room. The first is that we have a balance sheet that is out of whack right now because we had to take on debt during COVID to really secure the business. What we've done with our debt refinancing is we've basically removed $66 million in cash and pick interest over the next six quarters. We've frozen the debt with our lenders who have been very constructive and we've reduced our minimum liquidity covenant. What it really does is it does two things. Number one is it makes an announcement to the world that Rent the Runway is here to stay because Rent the Runway is also gonna be a break even free cash flow business next year. So any sort of rumor around the viability of the business, we hope to kind of squash. Second thing it does is it gives the market an opportunity to actually dig in and look at our business model, which we think is very attractive. We have gross margins upwards of 40% inclusive of our cost of inventory, inclusive of our cost of fulfillment. If you look at other profitable retailers, we have a gross margin already that has a 10 to 15 point advantage. So we think that by nature of freezing the debt for a period of time and bringing the business to free cash flow break even, that hopefully the investor community will start to evaluate our business model. But the second component to this is that the second elephant in the room is can rent the runway grow? And we just have been delivering a year in 2023 around $300 million, which is essentially flat to last year. So I understand why there is that question. Right. What we went into detail on on the call is that we've made some significant improvements in our inventory, which was a real problem that was causing elevated rates of churn. And so we diagnosed the problem. We It's temporary. We've started to fix the problem. We're seeing incredible incredible traction in green shoots of data. And that gives us a lot of confidence for growth going into 2024. So I want to ask about growth in particular with subscribers, because active subscribers fell for the third straight quarter to a little under 132,000. What level of active subscribers do you need to maintain to get to that uh, free cash flow break even level, that target that you're talking about? Yeah, so importantly, one of the things that we shared on the call is that we are driving the cost structure of our business to be able to be free cash flow break even, even in a 0% growth scenario for this year. So you don't have to believe in any growth in order to understand that we're driving the business to break even, no matter what. Second is that we intend to grow subscribers substantially. You know, one of the things that has changed over the last few years is that the market is way more open to rental and to fashion subscription than ever before. We used to be the only player in the space. There's a lot of competition right now, which is actually building out the market overall. So there's no reason why this shouldn't be a business that has multiples the number of subscribers than it has. We hold the premium positioning in the market with the best inventory inventory, the best customer base, the best premium brand assortment. And so we, by nature of getting to uh, break even, even in a 0% growth case, growth is just upside and just adds to the free cash flow profitability. Now, you mentioned it's become a more competitive landscape, that, you know, and people are more open to the, these kinds of rental services. Just to mention one, um, there's a rental service called Newly, which I re uh, understand is not apples to apples with you guys. It's owned by Urban Outfitters, and it did just announce an operating income in that business last quarter, which leads me to wonder if you have discussed partnerships with other retailers or even some kind of a deal with other retailers, if you think that the economics of the business model would work better in that kind of a situation? 
So first of all, our financials are not apples to apples with Newly because right. they're announcing operating group profit as opposed to us driving against real free cash flow break even. So number one, like it's not the same, their profitability. Number two is that the business proposition of Newly is um, targeting a very different customer, very different use case. Rent the Runway's customer base is primarily professional women in their 30s and 40s who are highly educated, who are sophisticated, who are using us to go to work, to go to events, and to kind of dress for Elevated every day. I also have a lot of respect for what Newly has built and how quickly they've built it. I think they've done a great job. They're helping alongside other competitors to build out this market. But if you want designer clothing, there's no real other place to go beyond Rent the Runway for this kind of service. In terms of partnership, you know, we have, again, a gross margin that is 40% plus, and that gross margin is inclusive of all of our cost of inventory, all of our cost of fulfillment. That business model has incredibly high flow through margins as well, which is one of the things we're going to prove out, you know, next year. So I think that there are a lot of great opportunities with larger retailers as it relates to co-marketing, as it relates to synergies. Of course, we always are having those kinds of conversations, but we feel very proud of the actual financial model of Rent the Runway. No one's really looked into it because we have this overhang of debt and this question mark that has existed until now around viability. So by nature of stamping out those two things for the time being, mm -hmm. um, we hope that people will actually dig into the actual economics of this business and they'll be able to see it as we deliver free cash flow break even. Jennifer Hyman of Rent the Runway, really appreciate your time today and helping us uh, walk us through all of this. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Julie. The buzz around artificial intelligence this year has rocked Wall Street, with investors lining up to see how companies will increase their exposure. And AI is a big theme at this year's Barclays Global TMT conference in San Francisco. Yahoo Finance's Shauna Smith sat down with Barclays Managing Director Tim Long to get into what business leaders are most excited about in 2024. AI does cut across in their own very different end markets, but um, using AI in different ways. So a few of the companies, Motorola for their camera business and uh, Juniper in their wireless LAN networking business uh, are really using AI. Uh, so they have real life use cases. Uh, and then, you know, Dell and Pure Storage and Juniper are uh, busy at work building either, you know, PCs for Dell, servers for Dell, storage. Um, different elements of these, these uh, large language model uh, networks that we're going to see. Um, so it's, it's really a big driver across the board for these companies. And Tim, you're a veteran uh, tech analyst here. In terms of the hype that we've seen of AI this year over the last couple of years, have you seen anything like it before? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty unprecedented and everyone is you know, calling it uh, a hyperscale or cloud 2.0 and it's, you know, there's, there's tons of money being invested now, but a lot of the initial money is just you know, going to NVIDIA chips and, you know, we're, we've yet to really see the rest of the build out. It takes a lot of storage and networking and everything else to get um, real value out of these uh, these AI chips that are going out there. Is it going to be the theme you think that dominates the tech industry at least next year as well? Yeah, I think it will be. I think it, it'll it'll shift from, you know, from these maybe, maybe more towards inference, what's going to happen next, what are the use cases, are there business models that will support uh, a sustained business here for a lot of these companies. So one of the biggest questions now is, do you, you know, are, is, the, is there going to be a positive uh, NPV to all these investments that are happening? So uh, I think next year will be a lot more about having more use cases uh, that people can point to to say, wow, this is, this is a great business model. I want to invest more in this. Yeah, and that the investments are paying off. Tim, with that in mind, then, who do you think is best positioned at this point? Yeah, so in my coverage, which is tech hardware, uh, probably the leading uh, AI play would be Arista Networks. Mm -hmm. uh, they make switches um, and routers that, um, you know, the networking element of uh, these data centers, and normally that's 10% or so of a spend in the AI data centers, it's going to be 15 or more. So mm -hmm. more networking intensive, they're a real leader in the space, uh, competing with a, a Cisco and a Juniper. 
Uh, we think they're gonna they're really well positioned for next year, and for the way they're. Uh, model is likely going to work. 2025 is probably the even bigger year as uh, there's some uh, migration of uh, kind of NVIDIA, uh, InfiniBand type of networking towards Ethernet where, uh, where Arista is going to be really well positioned. And Tim, another name that I know our audience is very familiar with and is a favorite among investors, not one of yours though, and that's Apple. You have yeah. had a neutral rating on the stock now for quite some time. Yes. Why are you a bit bearish? Yeah, so it's, Apple's a very tricky one. Uh, you know, we're, we're in a period now where the fundamentals are not good. They've basically lowered guidance maybe four quarters in a row. Uh, they don't give official guidance, but numbers have come down four quarters in a row, and the stock's up, whatever, 30 40% this year. So it's not always one as a stock that operates uh, in line with fundamentals. Um, and, you know, we struggle with the multiple, the valuation on it. I mean, this before... Um, you know, five, six years ago, this was pretty steadily a mid-teens multiple stock, and then after a two-year period, it was a 30 multiple stock. Uh, I don't know what really changed. So we still see weakness in iPhone 15. Uh, we were just in Asia. It sounds like the 16 next year's version is going to be much of the same, nothing uh, too different in it, which means if we're still in a rough macro environment, could be another year of weakness on the hardware side. Uh, and then we, we always identify services as, as a great business, uh, but there's some really big risk there. And obviously there's, there's this um, Google Department of Justice case where there's a very large revenue stream coming in uh, to, to Apple to be the default browser, and that's potentially at risk now. There's a lot of risks around the App Store uh, being investigated or in about 15 different countries. So. A lot of risk to the high multiple part of that business as well. And going back to what you said about the iPhone 15, not looking at the 16, but 15 from your checks, what does demand look like? Uh, it's fallen. Uh, we, we, you know, some of the markets like China was an important market where uh, Apple was growing double digits in the first half of the year, and then that turned down to, to double digit declines uh, the last few months now. So. Uh, demand is not great. Uh, what we saw through COVID for a number of their product lines was just a, a rapid acceleration uh, of, of unit growth. So uh, the useful life, if you will, of a phone uh, got shorter. So people were upgrading it more frequently. Now that's, that's passed and the compares are more difficult. So it does seem like we're still struggling. It's, you know, it's a big company and they have a huge user base, install base. So yeah, we're going to see flat type of iPhones for the next you know, several quarters, we think. Thanks to Yahoo Finance's Sean Smith and Barclays Managing Director Tim Long. Coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. There you have the closing bell on Wall Street here, and it looks like we are seeing a snapping of the losing streak in today's session for all three major averages, although a lot more so for the NASDAQ than for the Dow. As we have seen, things have remained pretty consistent here in terms of the NASDAQ outperforming today, finishing the day higher by 1.4% as we saw particular strength in large cap tech and communication services. We've been talking all show long about these AI themes coming to the fore once again with the likes of AMD. And Alphabet is just two examples. The S&P 500 participating in that as well, up about 8 tenths of 1%. The Dow to a much lesser extent, of course, because of its comp uh, how it's composed, uh, up to 63 points or about 2 tenths of 1%.
All right, now it's time for some of today's top trending tickers. Let's do shares of Sprinkler nosediving today after the company's preliminary guidance. You can see they're down more than 30%, truly, so just getting hammered. And it looks like pretty straightforward. You can pin this on, on the guide, specifically preliminary guidance for fiscal 25. Looking through the notes here, City talking about deterioration in billings and bookings, telling their clients they're still in neutral, but they did cut that target to 16. And other analysts really seem to say, listen, it, it comes down to, it sounds like the macro being a big part of the issue here. Yeah, most definitely. I'm looking at the stock year to date. It is up about 35%, so not one of the biggest runaway performers, but solid performance here from the company. And so, and it also to me continues this sort of continuation that we have seen of the enterprise spending cycle being uneven, right? Not There hasn't been like all enterprise uh, companies, all enterprise serving companies doing well or poorly, it's been really quite a mixed bag. So I think when you see disappointments like this, that, you know, it also speaks to the fact that it's uneven, that some competitors are maybe doing a little bit better as well. For sure. Yeah. All right, turning to the skies now, let's talk about shares of JetBlue getting a boost after it lifted its outlook for the fourth quarter. The airline citing healthy travel demand as close in, close in bookings have outperformed expectations. The shares up 15%. Of course, there's a lot going on in the background when it comes to JetBlue because it is still trying to combine with Spirit. We just saw the closing arguments uh, in the their attempt to get regulatory approval in that earlier today. So this also, the relief that you're seeing expressed in the stock also coming on the back of what has been some rocky back and forth ahead of the regulatory decision. Yeah, but when you look at I mean, they did lift their full year outlook. So right. and better than expected bookings. They now expect adjusted loss of 40 to 50 cents a share for 2023, revenue growth of 4 to 5 percent. That, you know, that doesn't exactly sound like a reason to pop the champagne, but it's about, obviously, as always, expectations. Yeah. Analysts say, and analysts are saying, listen, milder than expected revenue decline, slightly lower fuel. They're, they're going to take that. To your point, too, the deal is in the background here. You know, Tim, yeah. I, Tim Wu actually wrote, um, you know, now Professor Columbia, used to be with the uh, National Economic Council, wrote a piece in the New York Times this, this week, and he was kind of talking about that deal. I think the headline kind of summed up where Tim Wu is at, where he said, the bigger airlines get, the worse they become. So he's... He's getting his opinion very well known there. Although, as uh, well, I'll keep my thoughts to myself on some of these discount airlines and the flying experience. And finally, Nikola stock is under pressure after the company announced plans to issue $100 million in new shares and $200 million in so-called green convertible senior notes uh, due in 2026. And they were uh, pointing out where they were going to put those funds to work. But listen, I mean, Nikola was, listen, he even headed into this, um, yeah. it had been just crushed on a lot of headlines that weren't so great. You call the recalls and some recent changes in the C-suite as well. Yeah, their CFO leaving last month. So this is one of those that just, I mean, it's been beaten down. There's the three-month chart that you're looking at, but the stock is down, what, 65% or so? Yeah, I mean, it's down, I think, more than 50% just heading into this headline. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, this is, it's, it's more unpredictable when you get good news on something like a nickel, I think, than when you get bad news. Short interest on this stock is almost 20% afloat. Oh, yeah. So there's clearly a lot of expectation that pain is going to continue for Nikola. And unfortunately, this is another headline that proves them right. All right, the Bank of Japan might be set to exit from ultra low interest rates. Jared Blickery is here with us now on what's moving on the news. And that was big news today. It is big news, uh, kind of a sleepy December story, but I think it's going to be one of the bigger stories of the new year. This is the Bank of Japan. They were supposed to, they are having a meeting in a couple weeks, which was not supposed to be a live meeting where they're going to do anything major. Traders are now pricing in the possibility of a rate hike for the first time in forever. This is the result in currencies. These represent the Japanese yen versus a basket of currency pairs. Uh, the yen versus a peso up 3.57%. That's a winner. But I want to focus on what's happening with the US dollar. Now, this pair is prevented, presented inverse to how it usually is. But this is intuitive. If it's going up, the yen is strengthening. The dollar is uh, weakening. And we can see that is a big movement today, the biggest one of the year. Let me show you what's happened over the last three years. The yen has sunk. Uh, that's a pretty big drop big drop right now they're losing 20 or excuse me yeah losing 27 percent 
and a half of its value. That is huge in terms of currency. Why did we get there? How did we get to this state? Let me show you what's happened with global banks, central, central bank interest policy around the world. This goes back to about 2008. Uh, that's before or during the global financial crisis. And this is the Fed funds target, the ECB deposit rate, Japan policy rate, all three of these short-term rates. And you can see uh, coming into the financial crisis and just thereafter, all of them hugging the zero line. And check out this yellow one. That's Bank of Japan. It has stayed at zero and, in fact, has been at negative 0.1 percent since late 2015. And that's what may be coming up to what may be coming up to meet some of these other interest rate targets. Now, what could also happen is that the Fed could cut. And I think that's what the Bank of Japan was hoping for. They have been facing bond vigilantes trying to force their hand, trying to get them to raise their interest rates. But so far, the Japanese Bank of Japan has, uh, has, st has stood pat. And they've been able to finagle, uh, with their yield curve control, somewhat of a semblance of control of their yield curve. And this is what the three yield curves look, look like, all the way from one month all the way up to 40 years in the case of Japan. Japan is still sloping up, but that is only because of a lot of intervention in their currency market to produce that. So the concern is that there is a disorderly unwind of this policy in Japan that leaks over into everything else. And one of the things I've been watching today is the bond market. I want to go to uh, the 10 year uh, Treasury yield, which has been up 3% to, or three basis points today. That is not a huge move. And in fact, only one basis point now. We did see a bigger spike up on the open this morning, just after 8 a.m. What happens when Japanese rates rise? Guess what? All those Japanese savers are going to be more, more interested in Japanese bonds than they are American bonds because the interest rate differential, uh, that gap between the U.S. rates and Japan, narrows a bit. If the U.S. were to cut tomorrow, that would solve Japan's problems to an extent, but that's not going to happen. And a lot of analysts are saying that's not going to happen until next year, and maybe the result would, and that would be because of a recession. Suffice to say, there's a lot going on in the U.S. markets, but this really hasn't spilled over just yet. You take a look at what's happened in the sectors today, and it's a return of the mega caps. We got communication services up 2 percent, tech 1.2 percent, consumer discretionary 81 basis points, looking pretty healthy here. Even in the fringier sections of the market, uh, where you don't necessarily expect stability there, not a lot of red. So, this hasn't affected the U.S. markets that much just yet, but should we get that, uh, should we get, I guess, as we're getting closer to that December 18th, December 19th meeting with the Bank of Japan, and we do find ourselves with elevated bond rates, that would probably spoil any uh, hopes for a Christmas, a Santa Claus rally in the U.S. Jared Blickery, thank you, sir. Well, we've just got earnings out from Lululemon now, um, and it's a mixed picture here. So let's talk about the third quarter, first of all. Third quarter comp sales, excluding the effective currency, up 9%. So seeing continued strength in those comps. The earnings per share in the third quarter also beating estimates. However, a couple of flies in the ointment here. First of all, the company's fourth quarter revenue forecast coming in below estimates. It sees at most revenue of $3.17 billion. Analysts have been looking for slightly more. The other thing that catches my eye is the full year adjusted earnings per share forecast. It looks like full year earnings per share on an absolute basis below uh, is being cut, although adjusted earnings per share uh, is above estimates. So the main thing that appears to be disappointment here is that fourth quarter forecast. Um, and that implies a little bit of disappointment in the holiday season vis-a-vis -vis what analysts had been anticipating. The shares are taking a hit in the after-hour session, but, you know, this is a stock where there were some lofty expectations going into this. Yeah, to your point exactly. I mean, th this stock had had such a strong 2023 heading into that print. It was up about 40 percent. And analysts love Lulu. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the coverage, in terms of just the financial analysts who are covering this name, it's around 70 percent think you should own it. It's about 70 percent have a buy. So to your point, yes, expectations pretty high heading into the print. There were, though, even among bulls, Julie, there was sort of some notes of caution, mm -hmm. at least near term. And I think because of maybe some 
some of the caution they had heard from other, you know, I guess you would call it aspirational brands, right? Mm -hmm. From LVMH or Canada Goose. And so I do know even with bulls, there was some, some a bit of caution there heading into the spread because of, the, because of what they had heard from some peers. Yeah, um, so just got a look at some more details from the press release here. Just wanted to run through some of these numbers. As I mentioned, comps last quarter were up by 9%. Digital revenue up 19%. Uh, and in particular, a source of strength was the international revenue, which rose by 49%. That's because they've been opening more international uh, stores here. So that's been interesting as well. Um, and, you know, as you say, this company has sort of defied predictions that it would see some slowing. Maybe the fourth quarter does indicate at the margins some of that is happening, but it has been. Um, an impressive growth story for you know an impressive length of time at this point. Yeah, and you're. I mean, we have a smart analyst coming up to talk about all this, but mm -hmm. I think the international you know notes you were flagging were interesting because there are questions about China. What does kind of the long-term growth opportunity look like there, as well as questions about competition with some upstarts that I know analysts have their yeah. names on as well. Just one more quick comment here from Calvin McDonald, the CEO, who does talk about optimism over the holiday season, right? He says, as we enter the holiday season, we're pleased with early performance, well positioned to deliver for our guests in the fourth quarter. So we'll see. And again, as you mentioned, we're going to talk to an analyst in just That's a few. Right. Okay. As we close out 2023, investors are reevaluating their portfolios for the year ahead. And Wall Street is chiming in, releasing recommendations for the new year. TD Cowan naming biotech company Regeneron Pharmaceuticals a best idea, calling it, quote, one of the more fundamentally attractive companies in large cap biotech. Stock is up about 17% year to date, nearly in line with gains in the S&P 500. Here with us now is the analyst making that call, Tyler Van Buren, senior biotech equity research analyst at TD Cowan. So Tyler, uh, you're a fan on the name, you're bullish. How come, Tyler? What are, what are the catalysts ahead that you think investors need to know about? Sure, yeah, so I definitely think Regeneron's one of the top fundamentally attractive large cap biotechs. Uh, the thesis is really resting on three prongs. One is uh, their ILEA franchise. So they're the market leader in the retinal disease space with almost a $10 billion global franchise. Uh, we believe it's gonna be stable. There's been some concerns about that franchise over the last year or two, but they're launching their Hydos product called ILEA HD, which we think is gonna go very well. The second prong, which is really the biggest proponent of our thesis, is Dupixent, uh, also known as Humira 2.0, some are calling it. It could be one of the largest uh, drugs in biotech and pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's going over 10 billion this year. We believe it could reach 21 billion by 27, and their partner Sanofi just said potentially 25 by the end of the decade, which is really driving earnings. And then third is um, uh, the pipeline, right? So we're gonna get some data coming up at ASH uh, this weekend, and we're gonna get a number of readouts over the course of next year on top of uh, earnings from Ilya and Dupixin, which are gonna be critical. You mean, you mean to tell me, Tyler, that a company that's not currently making a GLP-1 is a top pick? I mean, it just, it's, fa it's been a fascinating year because so much attention and talk has been around the companies that are making GLP-1s, but obviously people still need to take other medications for other things here. Um, so is part of the, has Regeneron and has maybe a whole class of drug makers been sort of overlooked by investors during this hype cycle? Without a doubt, right? Uh, investing in GLP-1s has been a safe place for investors to be, especially when biotech is going through a difficult period of time. I would, as an aside, I would argue when you're calling for 100 or 200 billion in sales, which is many multiples over the largest drug that we've ever seen, that maybe GLP ones are a little overhyped right now. Um, but with that said, um, Regeneron's and Sanofi's drug, Dupixin, is uh, by far one of the most attractive drugs in the autoimmune space. And the level of earnings that it's generating, I don't feel is fully appreciated by the street yet because there's been all this focus on this transition from their ILEA product to their ILEA high dose product. And uh, over the last few quarters, we've seen uh, a point or two improvement in profitability each quarter. And Dupixin is actually driving two thirds of earnings, and that's going to continue to grow substantially over the next two years. And, and so, Tyler, Tyler, this stock, you know, it's, it's had a nice run this year. It's up nearly 20%, but you're bullish on the name. So you, you clearly obviously see valuation is still constructive here, Tyler? 
Without a doubt. Um, the price target that we put out with our best ideas note uh, was $1,000 per share, which could be conservative. Uh, it's a DCF-based price target, which is supported by a 19 to 20x multiple on our 25 earnings number, which is uh, 51 and change. Um, but that's also assuming a very little pipeline, uh, which is underappreciated, although we believe attractive if you start adding those products in, uh, as well as if you look at Dupixent numbers uh, moving forward, you could get earnings upwards of 60 to $70 per share. And of course, with that, the price target would go higher over time. Uh, what's most exciting to you in the pipeline right now, Tyler? There's a number of things. Actually, this morning we just got uh, data from Limbosultimab, which is their BCMA bispecific for multiple myeloma. Their CR rate or cure rate, essentially, the functional cure rate, uh, looks to be best in class. About half of patients on therapy are potentially getting what is virtually called a functional cure, and they're really at the end of the road and running out of options. Um, speaking of obesity, next year they're actually having their Activin myostatin inhibitor entering the clinic. Um, so that's interesting, right? Because the goal there is to reduce or, or increase weight loss, but maintain lean muscle mass, right? So make it sort of a healthier weight loss. Um, and then of course, Dupixent uh, could get approved in COPD next June. Uh, and it's shown data that suggests that it's the, one of the most exciting drugs in COPD we've ever seen with uh, exacerbation reduction of 30 to 34%. And Tyler, I want to get you out of here on this. Just a question on the C-suite. You know, doc, uh, Dr. Len Schleifer, he, he founded this company. It was back in 1988, Tyler. That's a, it's a long tenure. Are there, is there discussions about any changes in, the, in that role? And if so, you know, who might, who might take the reins? Not yet. Um, Len still has a ton of energy and is very engaged. He, he actually, you know, responds to our research when we put it out, which is somewhat unique for large cap biotech CEOs. Um, obviously, Len and George have been some of the most successful people on the planet by, uh, with ILEA and Dupixent, and I think they'll be able to repeat that success with some of their pipeline agents. Um, so not at the moment. He's got plenty of energy, and um, uh, I think he's got a few years to go. All right. Tyler, thanks so much for joining us today for that time and insight. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And coming up, shares of Lululemon are trading lower after reporting earnings. We're going to bring you in-depth analysis of that report. It's coming after the break.
Lululemon trading lower after reporting third quarter results. The company beating on the top and bottom lines, but fourth quarter guidance seems to be weighing on the stock. Joining us now, Brian Nagel, Oppenheimer Managing Director and Senior Analyst. It is weighing on the stock, but before the stock fell was much as 6% or so. Now it's down more like 3 or 4%. Um, is this an overreaction? Is this appropriate? And does it indeed, Brian, have to do with that fourth quarter outlook? Well, good afternoon. Um, so look, I'm, I've been digging through the results as you have. You know, there's a little bit of messiness here with these one-time items. So look, I, as I look at this report, okay, just to make it simple, I think you had a pretty nice beat in, in, in the third quarter, you know, more on the bottom line than the top line, but really a beat. The gross margins were a lot higher than, than expected. So that was a, that was a positive. Um, they did they did lift modestly guidance for the balance of, you know, for, for 20 for the whole year. So in that they gave specific guidance for Q4, which is slightly below the streak. Now, so to answer your question, I think that could be you know that in and of itself could be somewhat of a uh, an impact on the stock. But again, they're going to have their conference call here in a few minutes. I think it's highly likely they say something to the effect of, you know, look, we've got the holiday season ahead of us. It's an uncertain environment. We're being cautious, you know, and, and so they set the guidance accordingly. There's nothing in this report that suggests to me that the, the underlying business of Lululemon is slowing. Now, the other thing I, we, I think we need to take in consideration when kind of trying to make sense of this initial move in the stock is this has had a stock that's had a big bounce lately. You know, it's, I was just looking at the chart before I jumped on your show here. I mean, it's up like 30, 35 percent this last couple of months basically, uh, you know, before the market closed a touching all time high. So you've had a big bounce in the stock. But again, I think I think the business is tracking quite well here. And Brian, you know, it plays Lululemon in this kind of let's call it aspirational consumer space. Right. You think of L LVMH or Canada Goose, you know, that type of consumer, Brian, how are they holding up right now? Well, look, overall, you know, it's a good question, Josh. But I mean, I, it's, I'm going to try to make it a short answer. I mean, Overall, the consumer continues to hold up really well. You know, I've, I've, I've been through a number of quarterly reports here over the last, you know, several weeks or a few weeks, whatever. It seemed like there was a bit of consumer weakness in October. You know, some of that was probably weather driven with it basically being too warm across the country. But I think what we're seeing consistently, and I, I very much expect Lululemon to talk about this on their conference call, is that the consumer, when there's a reason to spend, they're showing up. Okay, so in, in that that reason, most recently is, is you know Black Friday or the beginning of the holiday selling season. So, I think that you know that to me is suggestive of a still underlying healthy consumer backdrop and you know this aspirational consumer you call it. I, I think they're actually in decent shape here. Well, and it seems like they don't necessarily need an event when it comes to Lululemon. I mean, their <laughs> their comps have been pretty consistent here. And as always, when we talk about this company, I sort of try and figure out what the special sauce is. What is it in your view? Is it something to do with the management? Is it just the nature of the category they're in? What do you think? Well, there's a very easy answer to that question. It's the product, right? The product is, they, they have a superior product. And, you know, look, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm an analyst. I've studied this company financially for a very long time now. But if you talk to anyone that wears Lululemon, they love the product. The product, it, it wears well, it washes well, it looks good, blah, blah, blah. You know, so the, the product is their competitive advantage. I think they do a very good job in managing their brand. But really, this all begins with a superior product. And I think this is important. I mean, we've seen this now for a while. You know, Lululemon is an athletic or athleisure brand, but it's clearly taking market share across clothing. I mean, more and more people are wearing Lululemon in non-athletic settings, for instance, work. You know, so that, that that's a big market share opportunity for this brand. Brian, we won't ask you what you're wearing on, on the bottom half right now. <laughs> Lululemon. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> hey, hey, Brian, let me ask you to just to dig into competition a little bit more. I'm interested, you know, some of your colleagues on the street, they bring up some of these the, I don't know, I guess you call them upstarts, Brian. The, the Vioris, for example, is, is a name that gets tossed around. How much competition, how much comp competitive risk do you think those kind of upstarts, Brian, kind of pose here? Well, look, you always have to watch them. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, 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 I visit these stores quite often to see what's going on out there. And I think, you know, some of these upstarts, like you can call them like, doing a nice job. You've got a nice look, nice stores, stores are uh, crowded. But, you know, in my mind, I mean, going, going back to the comment I made here about, you know, how Lululemon is taking market share across clothing. You know, I think when you have these other Lululemon lookalikes pop up, it just legitimizes the category. You know, and I, I think it legitimizes this athleisure category as something more than athletic wear. So there's plenty of market share to go around for Lululemon and the, these higher quality upstarts. 
Um, something else that also stood out to us was the international growth here. How much of the opportunity do you think still exists? I mean, they saw, what, 49% revenue growth because they're opening stores internationally. Um, and they've got plans to do more of that. Is that going to just continue to provide more fuel to the fire here? Absolutely. You know, look, this is a brand that I mean, so what we've seen so far translates very well overseas. Uh, you know, we've seen it in, in Asia and in Europe and other parts of the world. And I look, I think they're really only beginning there. You know, I, I was in Europe not that long ago I was visit, visiting clients of ours. And it's, you know, it's interesting in markets that what I think would lend very well to Lululemon. It's not there yet. You know, so it's in my mind, you know, as, they, as they continue to push in, particularly in Western Europe, you know, there's just a huge opportunity for incremental growth. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was sort of the failed mirror experiment, if you will, and Lululemon's attempts to sort of partner uh, or tag, tag on other types of experiential brands. Is that just not the way that they're going to, was that just they're putting that behind them and they're not going to do it anymore? What do you think? Yeah, look, I mean, there, if there, if there, if there's a blemish on the Lululemon story, I think it's it's what their, their, their mirror mistake, okay? And, and and I think they learned their lesson. You know, they they look they they made that acquisition at a time when uh, connected fitness was hot, was the rage, and and I, and I think that that was very much a, a me too type move. And again, I I know I know I mean I talked about it. I know some of my competitors out there, colleagues, you know, talk quite negatively about this too. But I think look, I think Lululemon learned its lesson. You know, this was not the right strategy. You know, they, it's now they're now largely done with it and in, in moving in moving forward. And, you know, and I look, I, I, I don't think there's there's so much good here. I don't want to I don't want to ding Lululemon for that mistake. But to be honest, that that in my mind, that was a mistake. Brian, we always love having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's talk Broadcom, shall we? Because they're reporting earnings as well. The company coming out with fourth quarter adjusted earnings per share of 11.06. Analysts have been looking for 10.03, so better than anticipated here. Um, the company, of course, talking about the VMware acquisition, saying they see charges of about $1.3 billion in connection with that. But Hock Tan, the CEO, really, um, you know, sort of taking a victory lap here in, in the wake of getting approval on that and closing on it. He said the acquisition of VMware is transformational. And he said in fiscal year 2024, we expect Semiconductor to sustain its mid to high single digit revenue growth rate. Then VMware, he says, will drive consolidated revenue to $50 billion and adjusted EBITDA to $30 billion. Now, you do see the stock falling here. That $50 billion is perhaps a little bit shy of what analysts had been anticipating. That might be mm -hmm. part of what's going on here for, for uh, Broadcom. But, you know, uh, we'll keep an eye and get some more uh, analyst commentary as it comes out to see if that's exactly what's well, going on. Yeah, it, I mean, it is falling, at least initially here in, in the after hours. We'll wait for the conference call. But also, I mean, this is another stock that just has roared yes. in 2023. Yeah. I mean, heading into this print, it was up more than 60% this year. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like, um, it's kind of like the Lululemon of the chip space, meaning <laughs> analysts just love this name. I mean, again, about 70% have a buy. And when you talk to those analysts, um, they, first of all, they'll mention Hock Tan. They really yes. like the management team, right? They like the business model and the operating margin, specifically, you know, Hock, as Hock Tan has kind of moved this traditional chip name into the software space. And you mentioned VMware, that's kind of part and parcel of that strategy. They did just only recently complete that $61 billion acquisition. They got finally the regulatory approval they were waiting up from China. And importantly, because it really is, again, that move Hock Tan is making them mm -hmm. into higher margin software. You saw them do it with CA Technologies. You saw them do it with Symantec. So one to watch. It'll, it'll always be a good conference call. Hock Tan is, is a fun listen. Yeah. And I should mention also that they also raised the dividend. So the dividend going up by 14% uh, to $5.25. And it's interesting because, of course, we just talked to Nancy Tengler as part of Goodbye or Goodbye. <laughs> Broadcom is her goodbye, the one she likes. Sure. And one of the reasons she likes it is that return of capital to shareholders. She said maybe the growth of that will slow to some extent as they digest that acquisition of VMware. But then you get this dividend increase here um, being announced in this. So, An know, AI part of the story, too, of, of course. course. That, that hasn't hurt. Yeah. No, you definitely sprinkle a little not. AI on things. Anything, happen. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Coming up, more Yahoo Finance on the other side of this break.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. While software maker GitLab swinging to a profit in its most recent quarter, the company beating the street's expectations also raising its guidance. And that was enough to send shares to the highest level that we've seen in more than a year. So let's talk about that and more. And for that, we want to bring in the CEO of GitLab, Sid C. Brandy. Sid, it's great to have you here. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's talk about that most recent quarter that you just reported. It was the third quarter in a row that you had to beat and raise revenue up 32% on a year-over-year -year basis. What's driving that demand? Yeah, the demand is being driven by software eating the world. Every company has to get better at making software. What companies are seeing is that they now have like 15 different tools to create software and they have to hop between each and every one of them to get it out the door. We consolidate that onto one platform. They don't have the integration costs and they get typically seven times faster in making a change. So this quarter was a bit of a milestone year, your first quarter that you reported profitability. Are you confident that you're going to be able to sustain that profitability? We told the street that for coming fiscal year, we expect to be non-GAAP operating income profitable. When it comes to what is driving your momentum, there's been a lot of focus on AI. I know you have been investing heavily uh, in AI. What has that done for your business? And more broadly speaking, how much has it or is it really revolutionizing the software developer world? It is revolutionizing the software development world and it's, it's helping out with so many things. If you imagine like one prominent feature has been like writing more code, but mm -hmm. the AI can help with so many more things like suggesting reviewers for your code, fixing security vulnerabilities. We've released 14 AI features throughout the development life cycle to help people that are available to customers today and that help them optimize their entire development, security, and operations life cycle. So what does that future investment look like when it comes to AI? How heavily will you be investing in that space in terms of future opportunities? Yeah, we're investing heavily to make all these features really, really great, and this 14 won't be the last. There will be more coming. Let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, stabilization signs that you're seeing in your enterprise business. Certainly was a standout here in the most recent quarter. What does that demand look like going forward and are we seeing signs of stabilization? Yeah, we said we saw some reduced demand in SMB. Mm -hmm. and what we're seeing is that our software, the consolidation of tools, it works best for the most complex businesses. The more regulatory requirements you have, the more complex everything is, that's when the value of having everything in a single application, a single data store is greatest. When it comes to some of those opportunities outside of that space, when it comes to some of the macro trends that you are seeing, how are you seeing some of your clients' balances? Because it is a very tough macroeconomic environment. We've been talking to a number of business leaders over the past several days, some of them scaling back in terms of their investment. Are you seeing any signs of that? Yeah, for sure. Our customers have to save money. Mm -hmm. And with GitLab, they do that in a couple of ways. They do it because of GitLab, they have fewer software licenses. They save on licensing costs. Mm -hmm. They save on integration costs. You don't have to duct tape 15 tools together. They save because their people get more effective. They have to hire fewer people. And most importantly, they can execute faster on their cost-saving initiatives because they get software out the door faster. How are you navigating this uncertain environment as CEO of GitLab? What are some of the adjustments that you're making as a result? Yeah, we've, we are cost conscious too. We've improved our profitability by 2,200 basis points on a non-GAAP basis year over year. And how have you been able to do that? It's been, we want to have growth, but responsible growth. So we've grown 32% year over year, but we have a cost conscious culture in the company. When it comes to some of the risks uh, that are ahead right now for your industry, what would you identify as some of the biggest challenges or biggest headwinds that you see on the horizon? Yeah, I think, I think AI is the biggest thing. It is a tailwind. I think it, uh, it makes our software way more useful, but it is a fast developing uh, space, so we gotta keep up. And what are some of those risks associated with AI in terms of what you are doing to try to mitigate some of those risks, some of those headwinds uh, that are very present and something that many business leaders are very closely focusing on? Yeah, so customers want all the features, the latest and greatest, but they also want to make sure that their data, their code, their IP isn't used to train models that then help their, their co competitors. That was our own Shauna Smith and GitLab CEO, Sid C. Brandy. And coming up, Warner Brothers Discovery inking a deal with independent film company A24. We get you all those details coming up next.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. Josh Schaefer here with Alexander Canal and Pras Subramanian. And we're starting off with something that's often in our group chat, a yes. tweet from Elon Musk. Mr. Musk today calling Disney's Bob Iger saying that he should, quote, be fired immediately. He said Walt Disney would be turning in his grave over what Bob has done for the company. We should also note in one of his tweets today, he spelt Bob Iger's name wrong. Yeah, which e had, which had e Iger's last name spelt wrong, actually trending on X, of course, <laughs> formerly Twitter, which mm -hmm. was kind of funny to me. I, I think, though, thinking about this overall, there it is. There's a misspelling of Iger. Mm -hmm. Why would you come at Bob Iger, Elon? He keeps doing this with big media moguls, people that in theory could be advertising on X if they wanted to, but seemingly probably aren't because they don't really agree with Elon. And it seems like he's just ostracizing more people by doing this. Yeah, and this all started because New Mexico's attorney general uh, on Wednesday, yesterday, filed a civil lawsuit against Meta and CEO Mark Zuckerberg. We know Mark Zuckerberg is a rival of Elon Musk of sorts. And in that suit, the AG alleged that Meta's social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram are not safe spaces for children, but rather, quote, prime locations for predators to trade child pornography and solicit minors for sex. Now, Disney pulled its advertising off of X last month after Elon Musk, uh, you know, showed his support for an anti-Semitic uh, tweet or post and continues to uh, advertise on Meta, which is the crux of Musk's argument. But, I, you know, I've been looking at a lot of reactions to this. I mean, clearly it seems like Musk is offended that Iger pulled the ads off of X, is continuing to place ads on Meta. But if you talk to advertising experts, that's something that's pretty common considering the user engagement on Meta or Google is much higher compared to X. X is sort of small potatoes compared to those bigger guys. So it seems like there's a bigger issue here when it comes to the future of advertising on X specifically rather than solely Elon Musk. But clearly he is still creating a lot of problems for this company. And it's sort of what you're telling me kind of is making me think there's a distinction here. Is, is, is Bob Iger pulled the ads because of Elon's behavior, right? Mm -hmm. What's happening here with the New Mexico case is that it's other content that's happening to appear on meta platforms that Disney ads running. It's not like they're mm. actually trying to do bad stuff or, or highlight bad stuff. In the case of Musk, he actually did like that tweet, right? right. Uh, my idea here is, you know, hey, Elon, just why don't you fight Bob in a cage match? Like, you did it with, with Zuckerberg already. <laughs> yep. Just go for it. Just do it there. But I'm just saying, you know, go back to kind of focusing on Tesla and go back and focus on SpaceX. Don't wade into this whole pool of what other companies should be doing or who should be boycotting who. It just doesn't work. And like you said, the targeting is better for those, those platforms anyway. And Ali, I think this gets to one point though, that we've talked about a lot, which is just rethinking the advertising strategy on mm -hmm. X, right? People buy stuff off Facebook, people buy stuff off Instagram. I know from a media company perspective, different media companies often see better engagement on a Facebook when you post an article or something like Absolutely. that than you're used to on X. Just figure out a better way to advertise, right? And that's sort of what this is getting at is Disney wants to advertise on Meta's platforms because it's a better way to pay for advertising. Mm. How do you do that for X? Yeah, and X really needs to figure out how to either A, boost their user engagement, or B, create a product that's attractive to mm -hmm. those smaller types of advertisers. But speaking with, uh, speaking of media companies, I want to now take a look at Warner Brothers Discovery, the company inking a deal with independent film company A24. Now, in this multi-year deal, A24 will run its new films exclusively on Max and HBO, HBO cable networks. Now, A24, very prominent studio. We got some really Really solid movies from them like Uncut Gems, everything everywhere all at once. And this is something that we're seeing more and more of with these media companies as debt piles on, as all of the streamers are really looking to reduce churn or consumers canceling their subscription plans. They're licensing content. And Warner Brothers CEO David Zaslav, he's been very uh, adamant that licensing is the future. And we've seen even Netflix hop in on this trend. I mean, Netflix has been very successful with licensing content. You could just look at Suits as a mm. prime example for that. That was leading Netflix for months and months, and that was originally a USA Network show. It appeared on uh, Amazon uh, before that. So this is something that I think we're going to see a lot more of. 
Yeah, just real quick, you know, A24, I mean, this is a coup for them right there. I mean, A24 is a really hot studio. Mm -hmm. I just watched uh, Past Lives recently on the plant, great movie. Uh, the re-release the re of Stop Making Sense was also an A24 thing, so a huge coup for them as they kind of battle Netflix and Disney and others in streaming wars, right? Mm -hmm. Ross, I don't got much on the licensing other than I love Seats on Netflix. <laughs> it's tremendous. It's tremendous, it got me back in. Yes. Or in for the first time. Licensing. I can't get into it. I'm, I keep trying. Yeah. Well, okay. I can't. Pivoting from suits, right? Let's move on to another story here. Morgan Stanley taking note of shoe brand preferences in New York City's Central Park. The anecdotal findings revealing the brand appeal among more than 250 joggers that they saw there. So I want to take note here that the only observed people that were running, not just hanging out, actual actual runners here, they chose Central Park because it's a place where trendsetters are at, and that might indicate future success for brands. I'm quoting here from the note. Hoka and On Running, mm. which are less than 20 years old, accounting for 25% of our sample. Two of the largest brands, Nike and Adidas, appearing to have lost ground in this category. Adidas, in the sense here, in the survey, in the informal survey, only 6% of runners were checked, they checked were running Adidas shoes. What does that say for Adidas? Hoka? <sighs> yeah, I'm a New Hoka balance. girl. I wear my Hokas probably too often, but what stood out to me from this report is how fragmented this uh, you know, industry is overall. I mean, none of the brands accounting for more than 20% mm. of the sample. Hokas were the closest at 19%. So that just shows how many options there are on the market right now. And I mean, personally for me with my Hokas, I got them because my friends wore them and that's what they were talking about as a, as a good shoe, a good walking shoe, a good running shoe. So I was influenced by other people. I'm just a chatter. That was my reason. I think it's a fun way to just think about Wall Street research, right? Yeah. And so, like, it's a fun way to attack it. What are people wearing in Central Park? And I think when you take a look at the stocks and what these companies have talked about in earnings, you've seen it play out a little bit, right? Take mm -hmm. a look at Decker's outdoor stock over the last year. Sword. Take a look at on holding stock over the last year or two. That's been a hot uh, one. Also yeah. up a lot. Like, those are popular shoes. Any of us could have figured that out by walking around, which is what Morgan Stanley did here. Everyone's got on running shoes or Hoka shoes in New York right now, it feels like, when you walk around. And yeah. so it makes sense that that would then only, translate to sales. I, I, they only observe runners, though, which I thought was interesting. Well, that's who they want to focus on, that, that key, like, sort of Because a leisurely athletic. walker, I wonder if, if that is a different type of shoe or if it's the same. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also uh, looking at sort of, they, they said that Adidas actually caters more towards the lifestyle people, mm, yeah. not that so much sense. the runners. Yeah. So, and even Nike back in the day was actually a running brand, right? So they're sort of going elsewhere, but it's the Ons, the Hokas, the New Balances that are mm. uh, sort of taking the, the lead here on the running stuff. But uh, I want to add here a correction from yesterday's earnings segment. Yesterday I said GameStop reported an 18 cent loss for the quarter. It turns out that was a loss for the company through three quarters of the year. GameStop actually reported a one cent loss for the quarter. We apologize for the error. I just want to say quickly on GameStop too. You know, we also noted yesterday about how the the board approved the <laughs> the ability for the firm for the company to invest in other stocks with their with their cash on hand. Sort of like you, you buy GameStop, it's almost like you have a tracking stock of other stocks in addition to their overall core business. I thought that was pretty interesting. I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts on. Yeah, that. I mean, it will just be interesting to see if we learn any more about that, right? Like, what sort of stocks would they buy? How does that sort of work? I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Just what, they have the ability to do it, right? But that doesn't yeah. mean that they've actually bought other equities. What other equities would they buy? How's that work? Is it good? I don't know. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you know, GameStop is a meme stock, and it's certainly battling a lot of challenges, especially when you think of the mixed shift of games going from more physical to the digital mm. world. I think a big question for GameStop moving forward is how do they diversify and have meaningful growth? Mm -hmm. Something we'll definitely be tracking, but first we gotta bring you something else we're tracking. Coming up, we're gonna tell you what to watch tomorrow. We'll break down all the stories you need to know before a big day for the labor market on Friday.
DocuSign out with its third quarter results. Let's dig into the numbers, which are resulting in what my esteemed colleague to my left called a bupkis in terms yeah. of the stock. It's a technical the term, stock. Julie. It's yes, the, the chartists chart. use that, I think. Yes, I think they do. So if you look at the company's numbers here, first let's take the third quarter results, which came in uh, uh, beating analyst estimates in terms of the adjusted earnings per share here. Revenue a little bit ahead of estimates as well, up 8.5%. Obviously, this is a company that's gone through a lot of turmoil, uh, management changed over the past couple of years after being sort of a pandemic darling and has now been sort of normalizing, if you will. The company's forecast for the full year, it's raising its numbers uh, very slightly for what it expects for revenue. Um, and the same goes for billings here. So I guess there's just not a lot for investors to get excited about. Yeah, and it, it has not been a great year for DocuSign. I mean, heading into this report, stock was already down about 15%. Now it's, you know, it's up about four tenths of a percent. So initial reaction is pretty muted. I think on the call for investors, you know, obviously you'll want to hear more about just the broader demand environment, the competitive landscape as well. That's going to come up. Salesforce, Adobe, you know, what, what kind of threats those pose? How is DocuSign kind of responding? I think AI investment, product updates, there's a lot for, to hear on the call. The CEO kind of did, did try to talk it up, solid third quarter, record non-gap operating margin and free cash flow, he says, but at least initially here, muted response in the yeah, after the stock, hours. Yeah, the stock has fallen in the past three, uh, after the past three earnings reports. Let's get to RH here. This is an interesting one. And here we're seeing more movement. The stock yeah. is down 7.5%. Um, it looks like here that the company reported a loss that was unexpected on the part of uh, analysts here. And the net revenue w fell by 14%. That was worse than anticipated. They are delaying the mailing of their big catalog, which they call their RH Modern Sourcebook. Basically, they're saying there's been a lot of sales in the industry. Uh, they've seen pressure on gross margins because of those sales throughout the industry. Um, and as always, the investor letter for RH is interesting reading. Really, they're trying to position themselves as a luxury home furnishings brand here. And they talk about that effort still being underway. Yeah, and, and the CEO, interesting comments here as well, just talking about some what they call increasing headwinds in early October calls. That two things, Julie. One, mortgage rates. He's known to peaking above 8%. That was a challenge. And also calls out geopolitics, by the way, the Israel-Hamas war as another challenge. Yeah, at the yeah. same time, the company is going ahead with its purchase of the New York guest house prop property for $58 million, which they say is going to close in the fourth quarter. They made the agreement to buy that property when interest rates were a lot right, lower. We'll be watching. Yeah. Finally, here's a look at what to watch on Friday. Investors waiting on the November jobs report. That's out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Economists expecting 183,000 jobs added to the economy. That would show some growth from October when, remember, the economy added about 150,000 jobs. The unemployment rate is expected to hold steady at 3.9%. There's been some volatility in the labor market. We know that thanks to the UAW and actor strikes. Tomorrow's report will also give the Fed some insight into the health of the labor market ahead of its meeting next week. Wall Street widely expecting the central bank member to hold rates steady on Wednesday. Other economic data on the calendar tomorrow, consumer sentiment, which is expected to tick higher. Here at 3.30 tomorrow, be sure to tune in uh, to Friday's edition of Goodbye or Goodbye. Mm -hmm. We'll get one trader's take on which Magnificent 7 stock you should consider adding to your portfolio and one to avoid. Goodbye or Goodbye. I don't know. I've been practicing. <laughs> goodbye or Goodbye. You're it very well. Goodbye or, or Goodbye. Now I have to tune in. I have to tune you in. You have to. I don't know what's going to happen. All right. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a good one.